against isolated confinement, salvation and social justice, the ACLU convened this uh, virtual town hall today. We know that New Jersey has the highest rate of prison deaths in the country. And with nearly triple the rate of New York and more than New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Massachusetts combined. These numbers highlight what New Jerseyans have known for months, that rapid and urgent decarceration is core to saving lives. We are grateful for the families and the loved ones of those incarcerated during the COVID-19 pandemic, some of who, whom have lost loved ones to the coronavirus for joining us today. Thank you for speaking out, sharing difficult stories, and for advocating for transparency, urgent release, and swift action and leadership from elected officials. It's my honor now to introduce a formidable and inspiring leader in the fight for justice, Reverend Dr. Charles Boyer, the founding executive director of Salvation and Social Justice. Reverend Boyer, thank you for joining us today and facilitating our conversation. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, it is certainly with heavy hearts uh, that we are here today. Um, as Sarah lifted up, there are a massive uh, and devastating situation happening within New Jersey's prisons. And today we come here to respectfully raise the voice uh, and the names of just some of the people that we have lost. It is my honor to be given the privilege uh, to serve these families in the capacity of helping them to raise their voices today and most importantly, to raise the names of their loved ones whom they have either lost within these facilities or whom they hadn't heard from or who had contracted the virus while in. And so with that, the first um, family, the first person that we would like to lift up and give her opportunity uh, to speak on behalf of on behalf of her loved one is a dear sister Trina Parks. And Trina Parks love lost her loved one Daryl Parks, who was over sixty years old uh, and and died in New Jersey State Prison. Sister Parks, would you please uh, tell us about your loved one? Tell us what happened. And also, if you can, if you can say one thing to uh, New Jersey's legislative leaders, what would it be, Sister Parks? So my brother Daryl was given a lengthy sentence 29 years ago. He was confined in the New Jersey State Prison where he accepted the fact that what he had done was wrong, but he gave his life to Christ. And he understood that when he told me that, I believe that God has finally got my attention because I strayed away from him. So this is where he would have me to be. But while he was there, he learned to be content. So I was impressed because I knew that he had found God and that he had made that his home. Although he said that, you know, you're my natural family, but I have a family here. Um, we spent a lot of time together before his incarceration. We did a lot of things together. Um, and um, I would always go and visit him. I would often um, work in Trenton just so I could be closer to him and I could go and visit him even more. And he always called. He always texts, we always text back and forth. Um, when I went to see him, he was always happy. He wasn't bitter, he wasn't angry. He was just doing what he needed to do. He was just doing his time. Um, to me and some of his friends, he was a role model. Um, he had a lot of friends and on certain days he would tell me to come on specific days because one of his friends and his mother, their mother wanted to see me. So I would go on certain days just to meet that family. Um, and to see his friend. Um, 
he was an avid fisherman. Um, my brother, um, he loved life. We always went out dancing and he was a good person. And like I said, I was impressed with him when I knew that he had truly, truly um, found Christ and that it was okay with him. So it was okay with me because he wasn't sad. He wasn't angry. He wasn't bitter. And he was just there doing what he needed to do. Um, and with that said, um, being 60 years, 62 years old um, and being there for 29 years with a compromised immune system, I can't help but not understand why there was no action taken to remove him out of harm's way when he was in the custody of the New Jersey State Prison. Um, and the custody means the protective care. And so he was denied protective care because he was still in the population on April 8th when he could not breathe and then they took him out to St. Francis Medical Hospital. And a week and a half later, he passed away. And I still can't help, I just can't understand why when the CDC warned that this pandemic would run through the prison and the most vulnerable needed to be safeguarded, why no one thought to safeguard these individuals? Thank you. Thank you, Sister Parks. Sister Parks, let me ask you if, if, if you could say one thing to the governor, to the legislature, to the DOC, what, what would it be? Well, it's a few things, but um, let me just be specific. And I would like to read the lyrics to this song that I put on my brother's um, obituary. And it says, if I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work until the close of the day, I shall see the king in his beauty when I've gone the last mile of the way. If I were for Christ to proclaim the glad story, if I see for a sheep who've gone astray, I am sure he will show me his glory when I've gone the last mile of the way. When I've gone the last mile of the way, I shall rest at the close of the day. For I know there are joy awaiting when I've gone the last mile of the way. And I like to say, let that resonate and hear those words. Governor Murphy in the state of New Jersey the New Jersey State Prison, you were the executioners that decided what my brother Daryl Parks' last mile of the way would be. And I can only imagine that last mile being a dark, dreary, and lonely road that didn't afford him the opportunity to be comforted by loved ones. You can admit your guilt and wrongdoing in the delay of safeguarding those that were vulnerable during the pandemic, you can change the legislation to stop the handing down of excessive sentences to black males while slapping their white counterparts on the wrist for worse crimes. You can release those vulnerable individuals in halfway houses, prisons, and detention centers to ensure their safety as it relates to the COVID pandemic. And the very least you can do is to offer my brother, Daryl Parks, and those who have passed away from the COVID-19 in the custody of the New Jersey State Prison and other prisons, a posthumous pardon. And that is the very least that you can do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Parks, for that powerful, um, powerful lifting up of your brother. Very powerful. Um, at this time, we would like to hear um, from Sister Shavana Holmes. She lost her spouse, uh, Tyrone Andrews. He was scheduled to be released in September. And she was very excited uh, to hopefully see him. And Sister Holmes, if you would please tell us about your loved one, tell us what happened. And if you could say one thing to our elected leaders, what would it be? Sister Shavana Holmes. And 
we may be having some technical difficulties. So while uh, Sister Holmes is, uh, we're working on her connection. <clears throat> um, we're going to ask um, we're going to ask uh, Sister Bernice Ferguson. Do we have Sister Bernice Ferguson connected? Sister Bernice Ferguson, we're going to ask if, if you wouldn't mind your loved one, Lori Price, uh, was waiting for furlough when he passed. Would you please tell us about Rory and what happened to him? Uh, and, and what would you say to New Jersey's elected leaders? Hi, my name is Bernice Ferguson. Rory was my firstborn child. He was 39 years old. He just turned 39 years old, March the 21st. And I am so brokenhearted because my son was a sweetheart. He had a laughter that would make anyone happy. He was such a joyous young man. My son was my first love. And to not have my son not come home and me not be able to see my son anymore and to hear my son's laughter and get a hug from my son has just destroyed my whole entire everything. My son was my life. And sure, I have three other children. I had so much to do with my son when he was to come home. He was shy of two weeks coming home. He was supposed to come home on the ninth of this month and I don't get to see my son anymore because I get a phone call from my mother-in-law telling me that he was rushed to the hospital because he couldn't breathe. And then to call and find out that they can't tell me anything that is so unright. And then to find out that my son had pneumonia and to find out that I can't speak to my son, I can't hear anything from my son when I was so used to hearing my son's voice on the phone just about every day, my son would always call me. I haven't seen my son in over three years. I had so much planned for him. I was going to throw this big party for my son and I don't get to do that. So the party I had to plan for my son was to go to heaven. And I shouldn't have had to do that because they took it upon themselves to make decisions for my son. That was my child. They act like he didn't even have a mother. They made all decisions for my son. That's not right. If I can tell the governor how I feel, he would be so angry because we all have children and never to think that nobody cares about their children. Sure, children make bad decisions. We all do. But to take somebody's life, that's what they did. They stole my baby's life. So all I can say is if there was a, a, a role put out in place that you were to release these people, 
that's what they should have done. Everyone that was supposed to come home with their short term, they should have released them and they didn't. And now I get to see my son no more. I have to go to a grave site to visit my son and talk to my son. I am so angry. I think they should be held accountable for their decisions, not my decision, their decisions. So the same sentence was handed out for my son should be handed out for them. My heart Marcus. would never be the same. Thank you so much, Sister Ferguson. Thank you so much. And we'll uh, continue to pray and walk with you. And we're praying your strength. Uh, we're standing with you. Standing with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe we have, uh, I think everyone can see the weight um, of this situation and, and how it is really affecting people, this is sisters and brothers, everybody who's viewing, these are people, not numbers. These are sons and daughters, husbands, wives, mothers, and fathers, not simply numbers. I believe we have Sister Shivana Holmes uh, next to Sister Shivana Holmes, if you can please help, uh, if you can please weigh in and uh, lift up your loved one, uh, Tyrone Andrews. Thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. Hi, yes. my name is Shivana Holmes and I have Tyrone Andrews in Northern State. He, he's been in there for a while on a uh, violation parole, which was dirty urine that he should have been out already. Um, he said they in there, they don't, they, they being sh strict by um, not, not doing what they're supposed to do by testing them on a coronavirus. They're not testing them. They, they put in, they said they were going to test them, but they're not testing them yet. So the people that's in there with corona or got the virus, they in the back, like in a, in a trailer just holding them. Like, is like, it's bad in there. He said is that um they they shorter staff so they get in the end of the stick so they gotta be stuck in the cell so if you have a, a distance how if you're supposed to have distance how can you have a distance if you're stuck in the cell with your with your with your person you're okay sister shivana take your time you're okay. Take your time. He, he just needs to be out. He just needs to be out. He learned his lesson on dirty urine. He learned his lesson. He in there for uh, mental illness, depression. He going through depression. He doesn't need to be out and they need to do justice. They need to do something. Thank you, Sister Holmes. Thank you, Thank Sister you. Holmes, for your courage, speaking up for your loved one. The sisters and brothers, a, a parole violation, a dirty urine. And instead of surrounding people with love and help, we incarcerate people Next up, um, we're going to have uh, the attorney, uh, Oliver Barry. He is the attorney for Sister Shatifa Cook. And if you've been paying attention uh, to the press, uh, uh, Shatifa Cook's loved one was Tiffany uh, Mofield that died in the shower in Edna Mahan. Uh, Attorney Barry, 
please help lift up Sister Tiffany. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the family was unable to join us today. Um, I've been in contact about the meeting there. As I'm sure everyone who's spoken today, uh, going through quite a bit and juggling quite a bit. Um, so let me first say, uh, my heart goes out to everyone uh, bearing their soul here today. Um, I always feel somewhat connected to those people I'm representing, but I will not pretend that I can truly understand the depths of the grief that everyone must be going through. Uh, I will share only that what the family has relayed is that Ms. Mofield was a, a loving woman who cared deeply about her family and uh, was paying her debt for the mistakes she made and was due to uh, be paroled within the year. Uh, was an otherwise healthy 43-year-old woman uh, that other than asthma uh, did not have any serious health conditions. And what stands out to me and what they've relayed is that they have not yet received any information about how their mother got so sick, whether she was provided any care and why she wasn't taken to the hospital before she was uh, so severely sick that at the point that she, she collapsed, she was pronounced dead by the time emergency responders got there. So at present, the family is seeking information about how this was caused to happen. And uh, I hear a theme in their stories and in the stories I'm hearing today that there are very legitimate questions about the ability of the correctional system to provide adequate care, adequate preventative measures such as social distancing, given the uh, practical problems that are faced by them of uh, their facilities, the, their ability to provide care. Uh, and I think there's some very, very serious concerns about the quality of uh, uh, care being provided. I'm struck by uh, a piece of the original Hippocratic Oath. And one of the earliest translation, translations reads, into whatsoever houses I enter, I will enter to help the sick and I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm, especially from abusing the bodies of man or woman, free or bond, free or bond. That was important enough thousands of years ago to set out that the care to be provided should not have a different standard or should not change depending on whether someone is free or whether they are incarcerated. And I think that's something important for us all to consider. And if I hope anything comes out of these tragedies, it would be a hard look at the services and care that is being provided to those who are incarcerated, as well as uh, a look at how those who no longer pose a threat uh, can either be released uh, safely or, uh, you know, found temporary housing for furloughs until such time as it's safe for them to return to complete their sentences. Um, so I, I can only say my heart goes out to uh, Miss Mofield's family and uh, to everyone here who's uh, sharing their loss today. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Deeply appreciate your work uh, and advocacy for this family. Uh, at this time, we're going to hear um, from a woman who was dealing with this from the youth justice context, as there are young people who are incarcerated who have tested positive. And I had the, the privilege of speaking to Mr. Juanice herself in regards to her son, who is in Jamesburg. And Sister Self, if you would please lift up, uh, tell us about your son, uh, who he is, tell us what, what happened, uh, and also if you can uh, lift up one thing that you would say to the governor and the elected officials um, about your son. Good morning. First of all, I would like to send my condolences to the ones that lost their loved ones in this situation. 
My son's name is Quasha himself. He's been incarcerated for the last five years. Um, previous three weeks ago, my mind just was wondering, like to call to find out what's going on, why I haven't heard from my son. I called on a Friday morning, spoke to a sergeant, never informed me anything. I get a call Friday night evening at 5.49 p.m. Did anybody call you? No, haven't. What's going on? What's wrong? My first instinct when they call me. Oh, Qua Sims been diagnosed with COVID-19. What? Hold, hold on. How long? My son shouldn't have been isolated for a week prior to him finding out he was diagnosed with COVID-19. He was already isolated. Was never notified. I was never notified, which is a shame because at the end of the day, that's my son. I still have the rights as a parent to know what's going on. With my son. With my son. Um, got the run around. Thank God for people that I reached out to. I was able to give, get a little bit information, but not. Still, it was a lack of communication. My son was complaining about symptoms for three days. Me, they should have took heed to it right away. Because for one, he has asthma. It's just not just came about because he was in the system that he has asthma. He always have asthma since birth. Two is they kept saying they was reaching out, reaching out. They didn't have the numbers. They have the number. They have the correct number. An emergency number. An emergency number. Which is my aunt. Which is my aunt. I just feel as though the system has to do better. Better communication. Just because these children are locked up, it does not mean for the state not to reach out to the parents which and why everything is going on i was promised extra phone calls i was promised video chats still to this day they still not hold any word the one thing that i have for the governor and he needs to know this that these children are human, are human just like everybody else in the world they need to be treated as if they were free. It's lack of medication, it's lack of um, care, health care in the facilities. In my son's situation, it's not that long. If anything that the governor could do for me, instead of in August releasing my son to a program, release him home to his mom because I might look good on the outside, but me not knowing what's really going on with my son is tearing me up in, in, the, in the inside. Thank you so much, Sister Self. Thank you so much for those powerful words, powerful advocacy for your son. Um, yes, we'll, sir. We'll continue to stand with you, our partners at the New Jersey Institute. For social justice. Yes, uh, sir. And all of us, Salvation and Social Justice, the ACLU, all of our partners will continue to stand with you in the call. In this conference. Call for justice for your son. God bless you. God bless you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our our uh, next and uh, last speaker uh, is Kira Priester. Uh, whose loved one is Darius Murphy in East Jersey State Prison. Kira Priester, uh, Sister Priester, please lift up your loved one. Uh, tell us about, about him. Uh, tell us what's going on uh, and what you would say to the governor and all of our elected leaders. Hello. Um... I'm the loved one of Darius Murphy. He's an inmate at East Jersey State Prison in Rawway, New Jersey. And I just wanna say that Darius is not just another statistic, but he is yet another innocent black man who is wrongfully convicted of a crime. And he's fighting for his life and his freedom due to the injustices of the criminal justice system. And Darius matters to me and his family because he's been incarcerated for 24 years. During that time, his health has been in 
compromised for many different reasons, such as unsanitary conditions of the prison. Um, he's developed psoriasis, severe allergies. He has an ulcer. And as of two weeks ago, um, his equilibrium has been off and it currently still is. He's been unable to eat. He's lost over 20 pounds within three days. Well, when he went to medical, they did blood work and he's still currently waiting for the results. They didn't test him for COVID-19. Um, they told him that he might be suffering from a neurological disease. Uh, the reason I'm concerned is because he has a weak immune system. So when he needs medical attention, he can't just make a phone call and be seen and treated like we can by a doctor. He has to go through a process and um, he has to request to go to medical. He has to put in the paperwork and then he has to wait for an approval before he could be seen. So, uh, you know, people are losing their lives over the coronavirus and some people show symptoms and signs and some people don't. And um, the medical doctors in the prisons, they're not equipped to handle certain conditions. And most times they just give the inmates Tylenol or Benadryl and they just send them on their way. And if my loved one, he needs medical attention, he deserves the same medical treatment just as anyone else. And he deserves to know that his life is just as important and that he's not gonna be sentenced to a death sentence while he's waiting for the proper medical treatment. If I could say one thing to the governor, it would be to consider the release of all nonviolent and long-term violent offenders of all ages who are no risk to the public, whether it be by exoneration, clemency, or parole, because this pandemic has proven that death does not discriminate based on these factors. Thank you so much. Thank Sister you. Kristen. Thank you for your courage. Um, thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for all of uh, all of these courageous folks who have lifted up their voices today. Um, we'll certainly keep keep you all in, in, in deep prayer. And we don't say that uh, as first as folks who uh, are too often political figures just say thoughts and prayers, but take no action. So we, we don't lift that up in that same vein, uh, but also as a, uh, as a man of faith, um, and many of the folks from our team who are people of faith and from all of us um, who wake up every morning in this work, um, we do pray and we, we pray with our feet, we pray with our action. Uh, and it is our privilege to, to stand with you all in order to raise these issues. And so we certainly thank all of the families for your courage uh, and for your outreach uh, to let your loved ones stories be heard. And as you can see today, uh, these stories are riveting and we not only have stories of people who have already succumbed to the virus, who should have been let out. But we also see folks who are currently still in, whose lives can be saved. And there are thousands within New Jersey state prisons whose lives can be saved if our elected leaders take action. And so some of the things that we are looking for concretely is that the governor and the legislature would enact emergency legislation, which would extend a COVID credit to everyone who is incarcerated, both in the youth system and the adult system, and take a year off of everyone's sentence who was due uh, take a year off of everyone's sentence. And what this would do by the numbers, it would immediately release nearly 4,000 people 
We also call on the governor through his uh, commutation and pardoning powers to release those who should be released for uh, issues of compassion, those who were elderly, those who were there solely off of drug offenses or parole violations like dirty urine, those um, who are there suffering illnesses, the elderly, those who have served outrageously long prison terms. The governor can take action today. The sisters and brothers, we will, we will continue to lift up the names of those that have been lost, the incarcerated who have been lost. Every single day in the press briefings, names are lifted up of people whose lives have been taken from the coronavirus. But the names that we have not heard lifted up are the names of the incarcerated. And so we will lift up those names. And we will lift up those names tonight during a virtual um, vigil. And that information is in the chat box and it will be broadcast live on the Salvation and Social Justice page, eight o'clock tonight, we will say their names. Second, we are having a funeral procession on May 28th at the Trenton War Memorial at 11 o'clock. And that information will be sent out via email. Uh, it will also be available on the NJ Cake Facebook page, the Salvation and Social Justice Facebook page. It will be on our Twitter pages as well as our websites. And we're asking everyone to come in your cars and let's drive around the Trenton War Memorial in memory of those who have been lost. And so sisters and brothers, it is with that, that we end this session. And for all of us who are people of faith and people of goodwill, keep these families in your prayers, in your thoughts, in your meditations. And please keep, please keep all of those who are currently on the other side of the wall in your prayers as well. We thank everyone uh, who helped put this together, the ACLU and all of our partners and sponsors in this event. And most importantly, we thank the families, Sister Priester, Sister Ferguson, Sister Holmes, Sister Self, uh, Brother Oliver representing Sister Cook and Sister Parks. God bless you and let's keep fighting until there's freedom. Have a blessed day.